like their ID. Um, uh, they had, they had uh, when Jack was a boy growing up, they had gone to the Cape every summer uh, for sometimes a week, sometimes two or three weeks. Uh, and it is for them the happy place. It is the only time in their marriage when they are happy. Um, and um, in addition to being bitter and disgruntled academics, they are also both serial adulterers. And um, so when they, when they come to the Cape, it's, it's the Cape is the place where they kind of heal all of their, their, their marital and professional wounds. Um, and they, there's reference to this. Uh, when they get to the Cape, the first thing they always do is go get two copies. They hate to share anything. <laughs> two copies of the Cape and Islands real estate guide, which they just pour over. And uh, at first day on the beach, they read about every single bit of property that's for sale on Cape Cod, and they quickly divide every single entry into one of, uh, into one of two categories. Either they can't take or can't afford it, or wouldn't have it as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine what it's like for a uh, boy, Jack Griffin, when your parents uh, put everything in one of those two categories, what his young life must have been like. Um, um, we need to know that at the beginning of this novel, Jack is now, as I say, in his, in his late 50s, his, his, um, his father is dead, his mother is in an assisted living facility, very much alive. Um, when he was, uh, when he went to the West Coast to become a screenwriter, um, they have been, they both finally divorced, uh, he married his, his mother, in an ecumenical mood, uh, has crossed the aisle from the English department to the philosophy department for her second husband, um, whose name is Bart. She quickly, um, she quickly uh, dubs him Bartleby for all the things that he prefers not to do. Um, and there's a reference to um, his parents' guilty pleasures. As English professors, they uh, uphold for 11 months of the year, they uphold the literary canon where they teach uh, in the Midwest, but uh, in their two or three weeks on the Cape, they have these guilty pleasures. Um, Griffin's mother likes to read what she calls twisted thrillers, and uh, Griffin's father alternates his beach reading, alternates between kind of literary pornography and P.G. Woods. <laughs> okay, that's all I can think of. Um, and this section I'm going to read is, is actually more about Griffin's parents than Griffin, but it provides uh, a backstory uh, to their second marriages. By the time Griffin's parents got divorced, each claiming that they should have cut the cord sooner, that they had made each other miserable for far too long, he was in film school out west and he thought the divorce was probably for the best. But neither had prospered in their second marriages, and their careers had suffered too. Together, or at least voting together, they had been a force to reckon with in English department politics. Singly, often voting against each other, they could be safely ignored. And the worst of their enemies now sniped at both with impunity. Of the two, Griffin's mother seemed to fare better at first. Openly contemptuous of the young literary theorists and culture critics when she was married to Griffin's father, she had reinvented herself as a gender studies specialist. <laughs> as a gender studies specialist, and she had become for a time their darling. One of her old guilty pleasures, Patricia Highsmith, had become respectable, and his mother published several well-placed articles on Highsmith and two or three other gay lesbian novelists. Panels on gender were suddenly all the rage, and she found herself chairing several of these at regional conferences where she hinted, where she hinted to her large and largely lesbian audiences that she herself had always been open, both in theory and practice, as regards her own sexuality. And perhaps, if it's supposed, she was. Bartley, who had begun their marriage preferring not to argue and ended it preferring not to speak at all. 
remain philosophical when these innuendos were reported back to him. Griffin had assumed that his mother was exaggerating Bartleby's withdrawal from speech, but a few months before his unexpected death, going to the doctor was something else he preferred not to do. He paid them a quick visit, and they all gone out to dinner, and the man hadn't spoken a word. He didn't seem to be in a bad mood, and he would occasionally smile ruefully at something his wife or Griffin said, but the closest he came to utterance was when a piece of, was when a piece of meat lodged in his windpipe, and turning his face the color of a grape, until a passing waiter saw his distress and Heimlich him on the spot. <laughs> But his mother's self-reinvention, a bold and for a time successful stroke, had ultimately failed. When the university, mostly at her suggestion and direction, created a gender studies program, she of course had expected to be named as its chair. But instead they had recruited a transgendered scholar from, of all places, Utah. <laughs> and that had been the last stroke. <laughs> From then on, she taught her classes, but quit attending meetings or having anything to do with departmental politics. Unless Griffin was mistaken, her secret hope was that her colleagues, noticing her absence, would try to lure her back into full academic life. But that hadn't happened. Even Bartleby's passing had elicited little sympathy. While she continued to publish, run panels, and apply for, the chair, for chairperson positions at various English departments. Her file by this time contained several letters suggesting that while she was a good teacher and a distinguished scholar, she was also divisive and quarrelsome. A bitch. <laughs> Despite deep misgivings, Griffin had accepted the university's invitation to attend his mother's retirement dinner. Joy had volunteered to go as well, but Griffin had insisted upon sparing her. There happened to be a bumper crop of retirees that year, and each was given the opportunity to reflect upon his or her many years of service to the institution. Griffin found it particularly disconcerting that his mother was the last speaker on the program. He supposed it was possible that the planners were saving the best, most distinguished retirees for last, though more than likely they shared his misgivings about what might transpire. And putting her last on the program represented damage control. <laughs> when it was finally her turn, Griffin's mother rose to a smattering of polite applause and went to the podium. That she was wearing an expensive, well-tailored suit only deepened Griffin's apprehension. <laughs> Unlike my colleagues, she, she, his mother began speaking directly into the microphone, the only speaker of the evening to recognize that fundamental necessity. <laughs> I will be brief and honest. <laughs> I wish I could think of something nice to say about you people <laughs> and this university. <laughs> I really do. But the truth we dare not utter is that ours is a distinctly second rate institution, <laughs> as are the vast majority of our students, <laughs> as are we. <laughs> then she returned to her seat. <laughs> Silence was, here's something strange. For the first time in over a decade, I wish your father were here. He would enjoy that. <laughs> His father had fared even worse after the divorce. He too had attempted reinvention by attaching himself to the new American studies major. He had always been at least as interested in politics and history as literature, and the university had been willing to lend half of him to American studies, provided that his colleagues in English had no objections. They certainly did. <laughs> his new office was one floor down in the modern and classical languages building, 
And one of the eight distracted graduate students had offered to help him move his 70 or so boxes of books and periodicals. A lot of bending over was required, and Claudia wasn't very proud. <laughs> Though he hadn't really noticed her before, but his father did now, and his colleagues noticed him notice, remarking that it was clear which half of him was moving down to American studies, <laughs> and which half was remaining behind in English. <laughs> Griffin was pretty sure that his father had little desire to be there, and probably wouldn't have, but for the university ban on student faculty student fraternizing, which was absurd. It wasn't like Claudia was an undergraduate. She was 29, a grown-up, even by American University standards. <laughs> she didn't need any institutional protection, though several of her male professors had wanted to know who would protect them from her. What Claudia did need, according to many in the department, was help, a lot of it, completing her degree. She narrowly passed her doctoral prelims on the second and final attempt, one of her examiners abstaining. After which it took her a full academic year to come up with an acceptable dissertation topic. And like, a, like the prize after at the county fair, she had to be led by Griffin's father every step of the way. To Griffin, Claudia indeed had bovine quality. <laughs> a full head taller than his father, she had wide hips and full breasts that always seemed to be in motion beneath the loose blouses that she favored. And so it was that this distinguished senior professor woke up one morning to the realization that while his wife had retooled herself as an adventurous gender specialist, he had reinvented himself as a fool. <laughs> Naked lunch, Griffin's mother remarked, had finally won the day, showing poor Jean the door. Which may have been why when an old graduate student friend, who was now a dean at the University of Massachusetts, called to ask if he would consider a one-year appointment replacing a professor who had fallen ill, Griffin's father eagerly accepted. His mother, of course, had been apoplectic with fury when she heard it. Amherst, after all, was what? Two hours from the Cape? He and that fat cow would be able to spend weekends there, or even on the vineyard or Nantucket, while she was stuck in the mid-fucking west with a mute for company? <laughs> She determined, according to Griffin's father, by trying really, really hard. <laughs> he and Claudia were gone a full year, returning to the university only at the last possible moment on Labor Day weekend. <laughs> Griffin, just then between scripts, had flown to Indiana for a couple of days. He hadn't seen his father during his adverse stint. And the man looked like he must have spent the entire time in a TV ward. He had aged a good ten years. Always slender and concave chested, he was now rail thin, with shrunken cheeks, and his hair had receded. Apparently to compensate for this, he wore what strands remained long on the back and sides, making him look like a Dickensian paper. <laughs> By contrast, Claudia had become even more softy. During Griffin's brief visit, she found numerous opportunities to insinuate her lush body near his, pillowing her unfettered breast against his arm, or if he happened to be sitting down on the back of his head, <laughs> just as his father appeared not to notice. They had returned with excellent news, his father said. Claudia had finished her dissertation, and to celebrate, they had gotten married. He smiled bravely, relating this, while Claudia's mobile version of that smile was of a different sort altogether. Their marriage had to remain a secret for now, he explained, until she had defended her dissertation and she had her degree in hand. Griffin wasn't sure that he followed the logic of all of this, but it wasn't any of his business, so he agreed not to breathe a word of it to anyone, especially his mother. 
which was why he was surprised when he met her and Bartleby for lunch in the faculty dining room the next day, and the first words out of her mouth were, so did you hear your father as you're married? <laughs> in fact, she was full of information. No, his father wasn't ill, but she did agree that he looked like death worn over. What he was, she claimed, was exhausted. And why wouldn't he be? During his year at UMass, he had not only taught all his classes, but also researched and, get this, actually written Claudia's dissertation. When Griffin asked her how she could possibly know this, since neither his father nor Claudia was likely to have confided it to anyone, she just gave him a look. And that's not even the best part. She continued, Claudia wasn't even with her father. When his mother dropped this bomb, Griffin glanced over at Bartleby. Though at this time he had not yet gone completely mute, he just shrugged as if to say, Don't look at me, I just live here. <laughs> Claudia and his mother went on, had gone with his father to Amherst. That much was true, but she hadn't stayed long. The tiny house they rented was almost 20 miles from the university, and since, and since they only had the one car, Claudia either had to go into campus or at least be, or, or be stranded out there in the movies until he got home. Work on your dissertation, his father had suggested. Indeed, he may have rented this particular house in order to give her little alternative but to buckle down. Her response, apparently, delivered in her thickest molasses blasé fashion was, all day long. In mid-October, there had been a coal snap. After several days of frigid drizzle, Claudia announced to Griffin's father one morning that she meant to go to Atlanta to visit a friend for a while. Even her pussy was frosted, she claimed, to which Griffin's father had replied that he would have no way of knowing. <laughs> Why didn't they discuss things later that evening when he returned? But by then, she was gone. Griffin's mother admitted to being a bit vague about exactly when his father had discovered that this friend wasn't in fact a woman, and also that he and not Claudia weren't in Atlanta, but rather in Charleston. Apparently, Claudia had been trying to throw him off the track, and here Griffin's mother chortled, as if his father came from a long line of tough cops and private eyes, and was the sort of guy who would immediately give chase and never, ever give up, whereas in actuality what Griffin's father had done was sigh deeply and say to himself, so, she's gone now. That Claudia planned to be gone a good long while, it was obvious since she had taken all of her clothes and not just enough for a short trip. She took everything, in fact, except the dissertations that she assembled with his help for her dissertation. These she left stacked impressively in the center of the dining room table, along with a sparse outline that Griffin's father briefly studied before wadding it up. In another minute, this gesture might have suggested that he was through with her, that he had seen both the muddled writing on the page and the clearer writing on the wall. Unfortunately, all Griffin's father had seen was a more sensible approach to the research and writing of his fiancée's dissertation. And so he took out a legal pad and started sketching out how things would proceed if the project were his and not Claudia's. That way, for the reason, when she returned in a week or two, he still hadn't drawn the necessary inference from the empty clothes closet, she'd find that instead of having fallen behind, she was actually ahead. The once murky, bloated purpose statement was now a detailed, workable template, thoughtfully divided into manageable segments and subdivided into bite sized pieces that required only mastication, a series of cubs that even bovine and Claudia could chew. <laughs> Granted, this was something she should have been able to do for herself and so was. It would be their secret. She'd be so grateful her frozen pussy would fall. <laughs> this, according to Griffin's mother, was how the whole nightmare had begun, as an intellectual exercise in avoidance. 
That first night, when he had come home and found her gone and substituted his own outline for hers, he would have been mortified if anyone had suggested that he might write, actually write, any part of his fiancée's dissertation. But a week went by, she hadn't returned, and then another, and the material still sat there on the dining room table, but he had moved them to one side to make room for his takeout meals. And he just hated for her to fall further and further behind. Of course, Claudia, again, according to Griffin's mother, Claudia had predicted all of this. She might be dumb as a plastic Jesus, but she was true. <laughs> And after all, how smart did a woman have to be to get the best of a man so ruled by his pecker? Anyone with an ounce of self-respect would have tossed her dissertation stuff right into the fireplace, or at least shoved it into a dark closet. But instead, Griffin's father had allowed him to sit there accusingly. Yes, accusing him, not her. Until one day, over Rushu Court, he came directly through the apartment, a thought had occurred to him. As of course it would. Maybe just a short intro. <laughs> Where is the harm? <laughs> because he had been complicit, if only self subconsciously, right from the start. Hadn't he made sure that the subject of Claudia's dissertation was one that also greatly interested him? Hadn't he known all along that he'd have to, that he'd have to hold her hand for every last page? How different was actually writing the thing? <laughs> Wasn't it really just a question of efficiency? Don't tell me I don't know how your father's mind works, how he rationalizes, his mother warned when Griffin objected here. She understood him all too well. Once he'd started down that slippery slope, he was a lost man. Writing the intro, he had reconnected to the source material making long, excited notes on cards for the body of the essay, its principal thrust and supporting arguments, until sometime during the holidays he had slipped a fresh piece of paper into his IBM selector and typed chapter one. <laughs> then, an interesting thing. Whereas before, he had been anxiously awaiting Claudia's return, now he hoped she would stay away. He always believed that this would be, what, a collaboration in the best sense. She would do the actual writing, of course, but he would be right there to share notes and ideas to make sure that she didn't lose her focus. And wasn't that what all dissertations really were, collaborations? Otherwise, why have an advisor? But now he thought, fuck it. He was making good progress, staying up late at night, negle neglecting, truth be told, his own teaching responsibilities. He had hit his scholarly stride, and Claudia's return would only break it. Maybe he would surprise her at a glance up during spring break, he told himself. But when the break came, he decided to just work on through, which was just as well, Griffin's mother said, since Claudia wasn't in it like to any way in the <laughs> He figured that if all went well, he would have a draft before the end of the semester crunch, and Claudia could help him revise it while familiarizing herself with his conclusions and methods, because, of course, she was the one who had to defend them, but he would be there to throw her away if she needed it. All might have been well, except that during April he had come down with a toxic dose of the flu. At one point he had awakened shivering, awakened shivering curled up in a ball on the bathroom floor with no memory of how he had gotten there, though the nearby commode testified eloquently as to why he had was he hallucinating, or had Claudia called the day before, wondering how the dissertation was coming along? <laughs> had she laughed at it when he reported it was almost done? Eventually, the flu ran its course, but Griffin's father never fully recovered his strength or the weight that he had lost as a result of the vomiting and skipping of meals. But guess what? He finished, and wasn't he proud? Only when Claudia returned, finally in late August, just when he concluded that she was gone for good, did the enormity of what he had done come down on him like a handle. Not so much the dishonesty of it, but rather that this could have been his book. 
How could he claim that the work was his own when it was supposed to be Claudia's? He could have argued that she, that he, that she hadn't written any of it. And anyone who, would ever, who had ever taught her would believe that. But that would only mean that he had stolen her idea. He'd already signed off on the fact that it was her idea when he and two other colleagues had approved the proposal. Mom, Griffin had protested, excuse me, Griffin had protested at this point, you can't know all this. And don't tell me Dad confided it either. They aren't the kinds of things that he would admit to anybody, especially not to you. After all, Griffin had just spent the last 24 hours with his father, who hadn't dropped a single hint, even an old leaf one, about any of this. Another woman might have taken umbrage at his, especially not you, but his mother didn't even slow. Pipe down, she said gleefully. I haven't even gotten to the best part yet. Claudia's <laughs> done failing you. Well, not in the conventional sense, she conceded. <coughs> she conceded. It's more like emotional blackmail. Since they had returned from Amherst, Claudia had apparently taken to wondering out loud what his colleagues would think if they knew what he had done. Had he always been so dishonest, she wanted to know, or was this a new thing? Was what he had done a firing offense? Would the scandal make the, pay, the front page of the Chronicle of Higher Education? But that's an absurd threat, Griffin felt compelled to inject here. She couldn't expose him, expose him without exposing herself. Well, that's true, his mother admitted, but he's terrified anyway. Didn't seem scared to me, Griffin said. Trust me, his mother said. But mom, the story doesn't track. Any undergraduate fiction workshop would tear it apart. Well, okay, maybe not completely, Griffin admitted privately. The story was more disjointed and inconsistent than unbelievable, and Griffin suspected he knew why. The Academy was a small world, and his mother had friends and friends of friends everywhere. She no doubt had been following her ex-husband's exploits at UMass, or trying to, through half a dozen, through half a dozen academic spies. She had gleaned small bits of information from a wide variety of sources, and stitched these together into a single narrative as best she could, drawing inferences and pretending, as she always did, to be privy to everything. Nor did she appreciate him suggesting that she wasn't. Undergraduate workshop? She snorted, right, now there's a test. Okay, Griffin conceded. I'm not saying there's no truth to what you're saying. I'm just, but she waited too long. Do you want to hear the best part? <laughs> The blackmail wasn't the best part, Griffin said. There's more. She arched a sculpted eyebrow. Get this, she said. The whole time he was in Hampers. Griffin waited until it was clear that she had no intention of going on without a specific invitation. He had to go on record as wanting to know what she wanted to tell him. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, he did. <laughs> what, Mom? He said. The whole time Dad was in Amherst, what? The whole time your father was in Amherst, she said triumphantly. He never even made it to the cave. Not once. <laughs> Is that on? I think we do. 
going to turn it up. There we go. Well, I'll there you go. Yeah. Um, you obviously have some background in academia from this and also from Straight Man, which I read when I was working at the University of Texas. I love the faculty meetings that you described. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 